physicians and therapists helping patients with sleep can be really gratifying, but it also can be very frustrating, especially when you're dealing with insomnia. I see this come up in physician Facebook groups all the time where doctors are like, oh my gosh, I really am so frustrated with managing insomnia. I'm frustrated with all of these requests for sleeping pills. And what do I do? And it's not surprising because most physicians only get about two hours of sleep medicine education in med school, but all of our patients have to sleep. And managing insomnia can be a little bit of a complex process. So we're going to talk today about a technique that you can use with pretty much any patient who is struggling with insomnia, but it's also really helpful for sleep optimization. And this is time in bed restriction. So we're going to talk about how to use this in your clinical practice. If we haven't met before, I'm Dr. Nishi Bhopal. I'm a physician specialized in integrative psychiatry and sleep medicine. And this channel is all about clinical practical tips to use in your everyday practice. Okay, so as a psychiatrist and a sleep physician, I work with patients with sleep issues all the time. And I saw a patient the other day who was asking me for something to take at night because they were having trouble falling asleep. And they were saying that, you know what, I just want something that's going to knock me out when I go to bed because it takes me too long to fall asleep. I also have another patient who came to me because they were waking up in the middle of the night. They were waking up for an hour or two hour long stretches of being awake. And this was happening a few times a night. And it had been going on for years and they'd been prescribed a benzodiazepine by their PCP, but they wanted to know what else they could do. So these are two cases where time in bed restriction can be really helpful. And I'm going to share more about these two cases as we go on through this talk. So you may have, you've probably heard about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI, which is the first line gold standard treatment for chronic insomnia. One of the aspects of a CBTI protocol is called sleep restriction. Sleep restriction has been shown to be effective as a standalone treatment. So even if you're not doing a full CBTI protocol, just doing a little bit of sleep restriction can actually be super helpful for your patients who are struggling with insomnia or who want to optimize their sleep. But sleep restriction is one of those aspects of CBTI that patients often dread doing. Even the name of it feels uncomfortable. Who wants to restrict their sleep if you're already not getting good quality or enough sleep? Sleep restriction is actually a misnomer. This principle refers to time in bed restriction, not sleep restriction. So we're actually just restricting the amount of time a person is spending in bed. But the reason patients don't like to do this oftentimes is because it feels strict and rigid. They're doing all these calculations to calculate their time in bed, their sleep efficiency. They're using sleep diaries. And then there's that idea again of why would I want to restrict my sleep? I'm just going to try to get sleep whenever I can. What we're doing with the time in bed restriction protocol is we're limiting the amount of time they're spending in bed to match the actual amount of sleep a person is getting. What this does, it helps to improve the quality of sleep. It consolidates sleep. So you can imagine if you have a small pad of butter and you're spreading it on a big piece of bread, that butter is going to get thin and chunky. So it's like cutting the bread down so you get this nice luscious coating of butter on the bread. So that's what sleep efficiency training or time in bed restriction is doing. It's also predicated on the principle of increasing the sleep drive and helping to increase the association of the bed with sleep. What we're aiming for is a sleep efficiency of around 85%. Somewhere between 80 to 90% is our goal. And that sleep efficiency again refers to the percentage of time a person is sleeping when they're in bed. If you're going to implement a time in bed restriction protocol, we first want to understand the person's overall sleep patterns, their sleep issues, but also any medical issues. Sleep restriction should not be done with patients who have untreated obstructive sleep apnea. It's contraindicated in patients with seizure disorders, bipolar disorders, and a variety of other medical conditions as well. So you want to make sure that this person is a good candidate for this type of therapy. We also want to establish a sleep window. We want to determine the ideal time for this patient to sleep based on their sleep schedule. You can even use a sleep log or sleep diary to help you figure this out. What we're doing is we're going to restrict the amount of time the patient is spending in bed and then gradually increase that sleep window to match their sleep efficiency over time. And then we can monitor progress with their self-report symptoms and then also using a sleep diary. If your patient is using some kind of a wearable like an Aura Ring or a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, you can also track their sleep efficiency using those devices. If information like this is helpful for you, go ahead and click the like button and grab my free sleep mini course. It's called Sleep Medicine Pearls for Outpatient Physicians. We'll put the link on the screen here and then in the video description below. You can go to intrabalance.com forward slash doctors to grab a copy of your free sleep mini course. All right, back to those two patients that I was talking about. Out. With patient number one, the one who said they wanted something sedating to knock them out at night so they could fall asleep. Upon further investigation, I really like to start with understanding what this patient's sleep schedule looks like and what their daily routines look like. But turned out they were waking up spontaneously around eight o'clock in the morning and that was aligned with their daily obligations. And they were getting into bed around between nine and 10 p.m. Remember, they have a natural wake time of 8 a.m. And they were getting into bed between nine and 10 p.m. hoping they would fall asleep around that time. 
time. When I asked them what time they naturally started to feel sleepy and when they would naturally fall asleep without medications, they said they would fall asleep somewhere between 11 p.m. and midnight, which makes sense given their 8 a.m. spontaneous wake time. So this expectation of being able to fall asleep on demand right away at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., which was just not aligned with their sleep schedule, it just wasn't going to work. And so this person didn't actually have sleep onset insomnia. That's how they were thinking about it. I'm getting into bed and I'm not falling asleep until midnight. I must have insomnia. But actually, it's just a misalignment with their circadian rhythm. And they weren't sleepy when they were getting into bed. So what did we do with this patient? I just had them get into bed later, closer to the time of their natural sleep onset. They didn't need to shift their circadian rhythm. Their current circadian rhythm is actually working for them. So we worked on a plan to create a wind down routine before they were getting into bed around midnight. So they would give themselves a sleep opportunity of about eight hours. And then if they find that's not enough, they can increase the amount of time in bed if required. For patient number two, this was the patient who was waking up through the night and having these extended periods of time where they were awake. As it turned out, they were not having any issues falling asleep. Then they would wake up during the night to use the bathroom and then they would be awake and they would have trouble falling back to sleep after that. What they would do is in the morning, they might fall back asleep in the in their morning hours and then they would stay in bed late in the morning trying to catch up on that lost sleep that they had during the night. Going back to that analogy of the piece of bread and the butter, they had this big piece of bread and they're trying to spread this little bit of butter across this whole big piece of bread, which is the amount of time you're spending in bed. What we did here was we also restricted the amount of time in bed to increase the sleep drive and that way we could consolidate the sleep. In this person's case, because they weren't getting those additional couple of hours in the later morning when they would fall back to sleep eventually, they were going to be a little bit sleep deprived initially. So you have to advise your patients that you might be a little bit more tired and sleep deprived at the beginning, but that's actually what we want to do because we want to increase your sleep drive so that you can get more consolidated nighttime sleep and just be really mindful of that through the process of time in bed restriction. How you can educate patients around time in bed restriction is talking to them about reducing the amount of wakefulness that they have during the night and that we want to reduce their sleep opportunity to an amount of time that matches how much sleep they're getting. You don't want to be severely restricting them. I usually don't go less than about six hours in bed. I feel like that can be really restrictive and severe for many patients, but for a lot of patients, sometimes even just restricting to about seven, seven and a half hours in bed can be quite effective. Within about a week on that schedule, they often start to notice that they wake up less and they sleep more deeply. And you can also do some coaching around how to help them stick to that schedule. So creating some relaxing activities and routines in the evening and also having things for them to do in the morning that they look forward to getting up for, whether it's going outside for a walk with their dog, or maybe they have an exercise class to go to, or maybe they have a podcast or upbeat music they li- that they like to listen to. And these are ideas from the Rise Up protocol, which can help with sleep inertia, which I've spoken about previously. I hope that was a helpful overview of time in bed restriction and how this can support you with your patients. We go into more details about these kinds of things in the Clinical Sleep Kit program. So if you're interested in learning more about that program, which is for physicians, therapists, and other health practitioners, feel free to send me a message and I can share more details.